Um, Olivia is pursuing her postgraduate degree in material culture and artifact studies at the University of Glasgow. Her master's thesis centered around the research and recreation of Scottish Bronze Age clothing, which will be the topic she speaks on today. Before this, she received her undergraduate degree in fashion design from the University of Grexel, from where she went to work for Colonial Williamsburg in the Costume Design Center, working behind the scenes, making and maintaining the 18th century garments for the interpreters of the Living History Museum. She will be um, speaking today. Uh, on, yep. sorry, terrible having the title over here. Making from missing material, Bronze Age clothing reproductions in the case of High Street Kakoli. So if you'd like to take it away, Olivia, oh, brilliant. Yes, let me just make sure I can do. Right, is everyone seeing correctly? Yes. Brilliant. Okay. Um, so like George said, hello, everybody. Um, thank you for having me. Um, my name is Livia Ballard. And as George mentioned, I'm relatively new to archaeology. Um, what I am not new to, um, very fortunately, through my experience is interpreting historical information and translating it in a way that the public can understand and connect a little bit easier um, with the past. And my goal in coming to Glasgow and studying material culture was hopefully to develop skills and, and a research technique to be able to go further back in the timeline and present um, historical garments and peoples that we don't have as much tangible evidence for. Um, so that is what I am um, um, talking on today. And I was very fortunate in um, approaching my thesis that one of my professors brought to me a project that was centered in the nearby town of Kirkcaldy. Um, and so you can see it there uh, just north of Edinburgh. And uh, there are a number of Bronze Age burials around this town, but the one that we um, are focusing on primarily is one on their high street. Um, so in June 12th, um, to 13th of 1980, um, the late Dr. Alex Morrison of University of Glasgow was brought out to do an emergency excavation um, during demolition of a nearby hotel um, where three Bronze Age kiss burials were uncovered. One was cemented into the foundation of a building and could not be opened, but the other two that were, um, we found or was found two um, human remains alongside a number of flint artifacts. Um, and it was dated to um, earlier Bronze Age. Um, so you can see Dr. Uh, Morrison there in the background of that first photo. Um, due to the post excavation research and his passing, the, the site never came to publication. It's now deemed a heritage project under Historical Environment Scotland and has received funding through the university and Kirkcaldy Galleries, its nearby entity, to bring it um, forward to light. Um, my role in this kind of post excavation study has been been to create uh, reconstructions of garments that these two people could have potentially worn. Um, the skeletal analysis has yet to come back to determine whether or not it is a male and female, but the choice was made to go ahead and create a male and female so that we can get a little bit more of an idea of what Bronze Age life would have been like. Um, and that was the reason for, you know, for that choice. Uh, this is the Kirkcaldy um, Bronze Age exhibition site as it stands now. Uh, it has on display a couple more finds from the area you can see in this little uh, display case. Um, there was a fragmented food vessel also found in our two Bronze Age kiss burials. Uh, and here you can see a Bronze Age dagger and a couple jet buttons in, um, in that display case. Those are from a nearby burial of Ashgrove and another one on Oriel Road. Um, so the decision to go on and make something that is centered around clothing is a little bit of a challenge because we don't actually have any textile remains from this site. Um, so in, an, in order to create something that we can present to the public as somewhat accurate, I needed to approach it in a different setup than normally we would when we think of reconstructions. We usually think of reconstructions as we have something and we make it modern well, with modern materials so that we can get a better idea and actually handle it. Um, with no garment to go off of, I've had to create a design space where I've narrowed down uh, um, options I can't use and can and what I have evidence 
evidence for and don't have evidence for into what I'm kind of calling a level of experimental accuracy. So it has a lot of things in kind with experimental archaeology, um, but there is a little bit more of creativity that's being pushed here because what I'm trying to emphasize to the best of my ability is the creativity of the people who did exist. And the fact that they are expressing that creativity onto the el other elements of their material culture provides evidence for us to express it onto clothing, even though it is the first to decay underground. Um, so the first thing that I had to do to kind of narrow down this design space was set up, set for myself a standard for these garment reconstructions. Um, Ida DeMont has a wonderful um, explanation for their standards in uh, Denmark for one of their most profound living history museums um, that uh, kind of sets apart this really easy three-part standard to understand. That top part is what we're talking about when we normally think about reconstructions. They're, they're beautiful and because we have have an exact copy, we go ahead and, and make new. Um, that B standard happens a lot more in living history. That's what I did a lot of in Colonial Williamsburg, um, where you need to create an entire wardrobe for modern people and modern bodies to wear on a daily basis. Um, that C standard is things that go into schools. Um, those are made of less um, precious materials, but sometimes they do um, it still work in those natural fibers to get children kind of used to what those might feel like. Um, after I complete my reconstructions, there is a local sewing circle that I am working with who wants to create um, a similar set of school age reconstructions to go into those schools nearby, which they already have a system for. So my reconstructions kind of straddle the line here between that A and B standard. Um, the second excuse me, the second um, kind of point of narrowing down my design space is in what textiles I use. Um, we have a, a, a wonderful amount of, of textile research that is happening in and around Scotland. Um, I know Dr. Harris is here and, and she does a lot of work on that. Um, but one of the nice things in terms of thinking in a fashion background is I can instantly delete all synthetic fibers, which seems silly, but it's, it's a big kind of narrowing down for somebody who's trying to create a design space. Um, so that leaves me with mostly plant-based fibers and animal-based fibers. Um, flax is very well established in the Bronze Age. Um, you tend to find even some very fine to medium fine um, linen materials. Hemp's and nettles tend to be found in more um, blended textiles, so it's rare you find pure hemp or pure nettle. Um, and wool is, is the new kid on the block in the Bronze Age, so there's a lot of experimentation that's happening with wool. Um, the, the thread counts are a lot chunkier um, which is proving hard to find in modern sourcing. That's kind of the stage I'm at right now after submitting my, um, my dissertation. And animal skin has been very well used throughout you know, um, the prehistoric uh, period. And by the Bronze Age, there is um, multiple methods for tanning and still utilizing animal skins with the, with the wool and hair on. Um, so those are the types of materials I'm able to pull from um, for this reconstruction as well. Uh, one of the other elements that I wanted to really bring home and push in these reconstructions is the evidence of the other material culture of the Bronze Age and the ability of these people to show their likelihood, propensity, knowledge of, and practice of mark making and design implementation. Um, you can see in so many of these um, uh, pottery, which we're all very familiar with of the Bronze Age, um, these are showcased from the Northeast of Scotland. And you can see things that you have to teach level one design students in university today. There's use of negative space. The eye moves from one side of the vessel to another. You give places for rest. You give a very unique shape. Um, and it transfers over when bronze enters, you know, the Bronze Age, where you see this um, this bronze razor razor from Midlothian, and you can see a similar mark making technique that translates from the pottery to the bronze. Um, this last example over here is this jet necklace that's from Melfort, and it has a similar transference of a, a lot of those techniques. And one of the things that I've, I'm trying to bring across is that if you're already transferring so many of these design techniques to objects that you don't necessarily even wear on your body every day, how much attention are you giving to the objects that you do live in and around day in and day out for a number of years? Um, so 
after all of those things have been established, I finally was able to look at silhouettes. Um, this unfortunately was the time I had to leap again away from the UK and head towards Denmark. Um, Denmark has wonderful preservation conditions so that there are actual existing um, Bronze Age garments that have been studied very, very thoroughly and are those kinds of archetypal examples of Bronze Age clothing. Um, this uh, beautiful example is the Eggbed Woman um, and her tunic and corded skirt was a beautiful, beautiful find um, and is still being analyzed and, and utilized as, as examples of Bronze Age um, design and silhouettes. Um, another example would be the Trinhole Man from um, also from Denmark. And you can see this kind of use of textiles. The cloak that's there um, is theorized that was cut from one big rectangle. And those side pieces, once you've cut out kind of this kidney shape, could be actually turned together and sewn. And anybody who works on garments knows that that's cre that creates a beautiful, what we call a bias. And it has a beautiful amount of stretch to it. And this utilization and manipulation of, of clothing and textile is what we call zero waste now, but is just a very practical um, opportunity in the Bronze Age and a necessity. Um, so once all of those things could be analyzed a little bit more, oh no, why am I not going on? Hello? Hold on. Oh dear, I'm so sorry. No worries. Have I been lost to everyone? Okay, no, I haven't. I will restart okay. that. Yeah. <laughs> Here we go. Yes, brilliant. So, yeah, right where we were. Um, if we go on, those um, those finds especially were very wonderfully accounted for in uh, H.G. Brawlholms and Marguerite Hall's 1940 publication. And though we would consider this kind of um, a little bit later than then you might want to think it, it has beautiful, beautiful firsthand accounts of these garments. And from that, I was able to create kind of a little bit of a catalog for myself. Um, and these were what I have, I've kind of labeled as silhouettes that I can pull from. So if you want to think about it kind of like an artist palette, these are the kind of paints that I can use and pull from to create different combinations or recipes of garments that can that can come together with that kind of level of experimental accuracy that we're talking about. Um, so this is an example of the, the male silhouettes. You can see uh, multiple types of uh, cloaks, a couple types of undergarments that would exist underneath it, um, belt and caps, as well as for the female, there's uh, the tunic that is very well documented and so many um, people have experimented with its construction, um, a couple different types of skirts, belts, and hairnets. So again, this is kind of that idea of the wardrobe that you can pull from and is being utilized at the time. Um, from there, I wanted to look at one more kind of level of silhouette structure. And from that, I went on to look at the statue Mahir of the Swiss, the Swiss Ballet. Um, and these are very well talked about, and I'm sure a lot of people have seen them. They're anthropomorphic stele that were found in um, mass burials. And they're, they're theorized to be representative of individuals themselves. And their garments were documented down to be unique and special. Um, what I really was drawn to them uh, for, for is the level of adornment that you see across them, because we tend to see a lot of reconstructions and we're, we're satisfied to do this, to complete the silhouette, but we never really go in with the details unless we have them and we want to replicate exactly that. But the proof that they are translating from one to another is really evident. Um, so this center image is on the recent um, uh, exhibition book that came out with the British Museum Stonehenge uh, exhibit, and they were um, talking about the Beaker people. And you can see this direct translation from the adornment on the stele to the tunic that this man is wearing in his daily life to what kind of mark making we're seeing on pottery and how this could go the other direction as well. Um, from there, I ended up, oh, not again, oh dear. Here, we'll do this and see if that helps at all. Um, here. Um, so here I switched 
um, mediums and I moved over to my sketchbook and I tried to fill um, as much of my sketchbook as I could with these kind of conversations going back and forth, taking shapes and silhouettes from pottery and seeing what they could translate to on the human body, what patterns I could pull out from um, a lot of it was pottery because it's so visually stimulating and see what kind of cording methods was being pressed onto there that I could put directly onto fabric and wear on the body, it would draw the eye and kind of create similar um, expressions. So from my sketchbook, I then moved to a swatch practice where I tried to pull directly from my sketchbook onto fabric and utilizing natural um, items that would decay at the same rate and wouldn't necessarily leave the, the traces that we're not finding. Um, so a lot of these beads are wooden. A lot of the cording is made of jute and hemp. Um, a lot of the paint could be done in the same kind of, you know, blue woad that we see on human bodies. And the leather is a very easy way to utilize leather scraps after any other type of garment practice has taken place. Um, from there, I was able to kind of do my final assembling and I created a female ensemble, which is a little bit of, of um, expressing those types of silhouettes that we pull from Denmark, but utilizing the Scottish material culture that we know we have evidence for and the patterns and techniques that are being used and putting them back onto the body and understanding that if this creativity is flowing from one direction, it can flow the other way as well. Um, so this is the female look. Uh, it includes a linen wrapped skirt, a linen tunic, which we know was in very well distribution and, and use in production in, in Scottish Bronze Age. Um, this mantle is a piece of wool that in the male reconstruction would be used from the off cuts of his cloak. So what I'm trying to express is that potentially th this couple, as I've effectively termed the Kirkati couple, has come across via trade a piece of wool and they're splitting it amongst themselves to get the most use out of it. It's a new material. They're not necessarily manipulating it a ton, um, but they're sharing it amongst them because they have limited resources of it. The rest is very traditional, is, is kind of seen more um, typically in the Bronze Age. So we have belts and bracers. Um, that gown is the same one where it's the two split corners put together on the bias. And this kind of ribbed band along the outside could easily be made of leather that is a little bit more showy and presentable across, you know, a male broad chest. Um, and put together, these garments are going to be made um, in the fall, which is what I'm currently working on. I submitted my dissertation at the beginning of September. And since then, I've been working with Kirkati Galleries to bring these uh, garments to fruition um, for a, an event in late November, uh, at which point they will be gifted to the museum for their use in their galleries and education spaces. Um, but it, it the 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 main point that we really wanted to bring across was even though the burials that we have in Kirkati don't necessarily have finds that would be earth shattering, what they do show are the existence of lives. And, and the powerful thing that garments have the ability to do is show us those lives because we can, we can associate with clothing. We still wear it day in and day out. And it's one of the easiest ways to connect the public. And I've worked in this sphere for a good while now. And I can see, I've seen the impacts of seeing those types of garments that we can imagine ourselves in. Um, so I want to say thank you to uh, Kirkati Galleries, to my faculty at Glasgow, um, to Historical Environment Scotland for their continued support of heritage projects like this one. Um, and for all of you for listening and apologies for the technical difficulties. Not at all, going to pitch very quickly. Um, <laughs> that was fascinating. Thank you so much. I will give the little emoji um, clap because it's <laughs> always awkward to try to do it on camera. Um, Absolutely brilliant. Thank you. Lots of um, ideas I really like in there, like the idea of experimental accuracy, um, the silhouettes kind of being one of the main um, ideas that you pull from. I mm. just really interesting way of um, conceptualizing outfits and kind of reconstructing outfits almost from sort of first principles of what do they have available. Right. Um, Absolutely fantastic. I just wanted to start off my question with, to start off the questions, um, with you mentioned the um, outputs in terms of your thesis and you've got the, you're making the garments. Um, is the 
you were talking about making the garments with a sewing circle. Are you thinking of, sort of releasing the um, uh, sewing patterns as part of your sort of output or? Absolutely. So the 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 museum quality reconstructions are only being made by me. The the sewing circle will take over once we end up mm -hmm. having those done, and they're making the kind of school age um, appropriate ones. I met with the sewing circle just this week, and they were very very. Um, hopeful of the opportunity to receive patterns for it because a lot of times they are handed a similar situation where they are given an image but no idea how to kind of reverse engineer that image into patterns and thankfully um my undergraduate education was very uh, thorough in the way of, of utilizing patterns in that way um there are a number of really remarkable um people who release you know digital patterns or at least technical flats of those types of patterns mm -hmm. Um, I am perfectly happy to make anything free and available, but I, I don't know what interest there will be, but any any opportunity to make that available, I would I would advocate for. Absolutely brilliant. Yeah. Um, you're getting a great response in the chat. I think that we definitely want more of you at the LPFG. Um, Tess says what I kind of wanted to say much more eloquently, which is an educated guess in the best sense of the phrase and a great talking point to stimulate ideas. Wonderful. Um, and Meredith asks, what evidence is there, if any, for dyeing of cloth um, of the Bronze Age for presentation? Not a ton of dyeing is taking place yet. Um, a lot of what I have been um, working to find is natural fibers. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a lot easier to find in those kind of linen contexts, less uh, easy to find in wool, as I have been finding. Um, and uh, it, it, there is also a very big propensity for wool to instantly, you know, move into those kind of twill weaves and herring bones that we're so used to and love. Um, but uh, not as much in terms of of dyeing yet, and especially in wool, there's um, there's a there's a type of um, kind of sheep that's that's called a mouflon, and they have that kind of hairy textured natural. It, it ends up looking quite dappled, but it is not dyed per se. Um, and so that, that's a very good question. And in the absence of dye what else would you have done to make something visually interesting? You know, and that's one of those big things where you can, you know, we sit around and, and think of all those times around the fire. That's what archaeologists always end up talking about is what you do in the downtime. And in my head, that's exactly what I would have done. I would have continued to have worked on my garments and mended them and made repairs to them and added adornment to them slowly over time. And there's, there's, when you kind of start thinking about it like that, there's a lot that is feasible and possible within just those small parameters, which is what I wanted to demonstrate in my thesis. Fantastic. Um, just seeing if any more questions come in. Again, of course, please feel free to add in more questions for the discussion session at the end. Um, I was really interested by DeMont's um, three different standards. And I know you've um, focused on experimental accuracy as the kind of your um, focus, but did you consider or would you consider uh, almost having different outfits mm. kind of made to the different standards, whether it's sort of the more um, reconstructed, more sort of imaginative garment, and then there's the ones where I said, purely we, we have evidence for, we have textile remains which show all of these right. things. If there were those in Scotland, it would be a wonderful thing. At, at the moment, I and Dr. Harris might might know more accurately than I, as far as I'm aware, there are no whole existing garments in Scotland um, that exist from this period. So much, much of the reason why I had to move all the way to Denmark was because that's one of our nearest, you know, neighbors where we end up getting full garments that exist in those types of contexts that can be studied. Um, so uh, yeah, the, the standards are, are wonderful for that kind of jumping off point to what I, what I like them for is just the ability to specify what it is you're going to make before you set out to make it so that you're not misleading mm. anybody. You know, you're not creating something to the B standard, claiming it's something from the A. If you, if you set out yeah. understanding what your goal is, then the likelihood of misleading the public, it diminishes. Yeah, no, absolutely. It feels like it's really um, kind of a gold standard in um, uh, 
orbs of a golden rule in reconstruction just of like be bit. clear what you're doing with this and then everyone right will and in. you know there are amateur interpreters who do this all the time and it's their life's passion and you know they don't always have access to the most up-to-date information which is not entirely their fault but they all you know this this concept of accuracy is thrown around in these circles so much and everybody Absolutely. is nitpicking over it all for good reason um, but, you know, if, if you set out saying up front what it is you're out there to create, then those discussions are less likely to happen and those kind of back and forth are less likely to muddy the waters. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I know, you know, but, um, uh, talking to reenactors, it's, as you say, yes. such a big thing and the yeah. um, interaction between some accuracy and wearability and yeah. yeah. And anytime those types of entities interact, there's a great deal of passion that exists in those spaces, which is wonderful. Um, but yeah, it, the, the, it can get quite heated. Yeah. <laughs>